All right, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk about the second type of the improper integrals. Importantly, what's different about these improper integrals is just by looking at the integral right away, it might not be obvious that these are improper. In this case, instead of having the, the limits of our, of our integral or the interval over which we're looking at being to infinity or negative infinity, like these infinitely long, these long intervals, in these cases, we are going to have values, so finite values for, for our A and our B, so the limits of our integral, though the issue is we have a discontinuity at one of their limits. To help us think about this real quick, before we get into these definitions, let's just consider the function f of x equals 1 over x squared. We've actually looked at this already uh, on these improper integrals that go to infinity, but this will be useful in talking about these types of limits. Specifically, let's consider this limit right, or this integral right here. So let's say we go uh, from, uh, from 4 is our upper bound and, and 0 is our lower bound of 1 over x squared dx. What that would represent is if, uh, let's just say this is 4 right here, we're looking to see if we can define this area. And what you'll notice in this case, just as with the other type of improper integrals, is we have this, this fact that as we go to zero, this function actually does never reaches x equals zero on this case. This would be of this type right here of improper integral. And in the same way, if we took the, in, the definite integral from negative 4 to 0 of 1 over x squared dx, again, that would be over here, we're doing this same thing. And the idea in this case, again, these are just regular finite values. The issue is, is that one of these bounds, or in the third type, is a value within the interval which we're integrating. But in these cases, we have these discontinuous points, in this case, at 0. And poorly again, just like we did with the other version of improper integrals, it's important to understand is that our definite integral as we've defined only works, we can only evaluate that on values for what f is continuous. So the definition for, for a, an integral is based on the fact that f is continuous from a all the way to b, including a and b. Here we're defining a little bit of nuance given the name improper is the reason for that. For if we have these and one side of, of our interval is it's not continuous at. And so here's how we deal with it. In this case, we have this integral again from A to B. These are, these are simply numbers that we're going from on this interval. Um, and B is the issue. It's discontinuous at B. So what we're going to do is we're going to define the, the definite integral from A to T. And we're going to make sure that T values are values that actually will work. And so what we're going to do is define the values of t are values that are going to approach b from the left. And let me write the rest of it out here and but declare that that uh, very clearly is that in this case we're looking for the limit as t approaches b from the left. And this is important. These are values if we approach b from the left then we're coming at B within this interval here, going from A all the way up to the values to get very close to B. But again, the idea of the limit gives us this concept of, okay, we're actually never gonna plug in B. We're not allowed to because that would that's a discontinuous point for this function. But all the values right before B are just fine. And so this actually gives us a way of playing with this. In the same way, if we have an integral that's discontinuous at the lower bound of the interval right here, but continuous everywhere else, what we're simply going to do is the same trick, put a t down here for that awkward a value, keep our b right there, and in this case, we're going to be looking for it as the limit as t approaches a, and now we're going to be coming from the right. And of course, we need our f of x and dx in here. In our third example, we don't actually have issues at our endpoints. What we instead has is that this function is continuous everywhere on a, b, including those endpoints a, b. So the issue isn't here at all. The issue is what's happening at c for some value c that's on this interval. I should actually declare that real fast. So for c, where C is on this interval right here. 
In this case right here, it's very similar to that negative infinity to infinity and proper integral that we saw with type one. In this case, what we're gonna do though, is we're gonna take from A and go all the way up to C. So we're gonna integrate that. This will be itself an improper integral. In this case, this upper bound of C is, is, that, is that awkward point, the discontinuous point. Um, and then what we're going to do is using our, our properties of integrals, we know then if we go from A to C and then add the integral from C to B, which we will do, this will cover the entire integral from A to B. And it's important to note here, I won't write them in, but for each of these, we would have to define them with these, these, these respective um, limit statements. So just to clarify this last type right here, let's say we had this function right here, which is f of x equals one over x minus five. And let's say we're being given uh, the integral, let's just go from uh, zero to seven in this case of this function one over x minus five. If we wanted to integrate that, we actually can't just go from zero to seven and evaluate that because of this discontinuous point between zero and seven. So we're looking between zero and then seven right here. Um, and again, I'm just kind of shading this area that would represent that integral. In that case, we can't just go all the way from zero to seven. We'd have to identify the fact that this function is not continuous on that whole interval. We would break this up from zero to five for our first integral, and then we would go from five to seven. Also really important, and this is the same with that third type the third piece of the first type of improper integrals is the fact that for this to be convergent and for it to have a value, both of these must converge. All right, let's now play with a couple of these examples, see how we do these. And again, uh, there's not much going on here different than what we did before. It's just more identifying of where that awkward point is in between. And as you go forward, it's really important to know now is that you can't just put your head down and make sure that you evaluate from, from zero to seven on this antiderivative of this function right here. You have to make sure that you don't have this discontinuous point on the interval over which you're integrating. All right, in this first example, we're looking to integrate the function one over the square root of three minus x on the interval from negative one to three. Hopefully that you can see in this case, because of the zero we get in the denominator, the issue is here at this upper limit right here. This function is not continuous at x equals three. So what we're going to do is simply set up our uh, limit definition of this indefinite integral. And so we're going to go from negative one to t, and we're going to have t is going to approach three. And again, in this case, we're gonna approach t from the left. So going from negative one up to three is what we want this to go to, but we're going from the left-hand side on the inside of this integral rising up to t. And uh, we still have to deal then uh, with this part right here. As always, what I'm gonna do, I don't, this isn't a really difficult u sub, but I'm gonna use u substitution to get this integral taken care of. And so I'm just gonna look at just that, the indefinite integral version of this real fast and do this substitution. So we have three minus x dx. And in this case, I'm going to let u equal three minus x, which means that du equals negative dx. And uh, so I'll, I'll just put this negative over here, either side, make that a positive. So when I switch out my dx, I just get a negative du. So I now have one over, instead of the square root, I'll write this as u to the one half. And then I swap out that du and I get a negative out here. Um, and then um, maybe I'll just rewrite this real fast. Uh, I'll just do it underneath here. So what I'll have is negative u to the negative one half du. Now I can apply the anti-power rule here. So I get negative u to the one half divided by one half, but I'll just write that as a multiplication of two plus c. But since I'll be dealing with a definite integral over here, the c is not important. 
And then before I go over here and start doing the limit work with this, I need to make sure that I put this back in terms of X. And so maybe I'll actually write it over here. So U in this case is three minus X. So this is negative two um, times three minus X to the one half. So let's get this going. So now I have the limit still as T approaches three from the left. And this is gonna be of negative two and I'll just write this as the square root, just because it's a little bit easier to write, three minus x, and then we're going to evaluate that from negative one to t. And here I'm almost ready to deal with the limit part, so we have this still hanging out, exciting, almost ready to do the limit work. Let's plug these in. So first I'm gonna plug in a t here, so that first term is going to be negative two, times three minus t. And then the second term, I'm plugging in a negative one here. And I just wanna, I'll do this kind of quick. It's three minus negative one, which makes this the square root of four. When I plug in the negative one, square root of four is two. So it's negative two times two. So it's gonna be minus a negative four or plus four. Now we do the limit work. And remember, we have all these different kind of limit rules. In this case right here, I'm actually allowed to move this limit inside of a, a square root because I'm not dealing with any domain issues. There's no, no issue with that. This is just a constant. So as t goes to anything, this will go to four. Uh, the question is what happens to this? And actually I can direct sub that in and I'll just write that out. Um, what this becomes is negative two square root of three minus three plus four. That's all just zero. And so I get that this is four, which again, this importantly means that this is convergent. Important to note in this example, and you'll see in all of these improper integrals of type two, is that the limit work is gonna be very different, right? With the with type one improper integrals, we were always dealing with these limits that go to infinity. And so those conversations are all about asymptotic behavior or, or denominators and denominators getting really big uh, and that, that mix with each other. Sometimes, often, when you do those kinds of type one improper integrals, you'll employ um, L'Hopital's rules or other methods of, ana of analyzing those, those difficult infinite type limits. In these cases right here, we're going to always have a certain value we're going to from the left or from the right. In these cases, often the limit work will be a bit easier. And again, in this case, I'm allowed to plug in three into this because three or all the numbers to the left of three or less than three don't break any domain restrictions of this function right here. And when I plug in three, there is no domain restrictions. The square root or the square root of three minus t is valid when I plug in a three there. Importantly, again, just to, just to say it, that wasn't the case with the original function, but that's not what I'm applying the limit to. It's this evaluated antiderivative. And then in this case, I just use direct substitution right here. That goes to zero, leaving me with just this constant term. All right, in our second example here, we're looking at the function one over x minus two squared from zero to five. Now in this case, this is the third part of these type two improper integrals because that discontinuous point here occurs at x equals two. So this is not continuous at x equals two. So what we're going to do, the first move is be going to be to rewrite this in terms, in terms of these two integrals we have to look at. We're going to go from zero to two of this function right here. And we're going to add to that the integral from 2 to 5. So over here, I'm just going to play with the indefinite integral part, just so I like to keep it separate from all the limit work. And so I'm looking at this of uh, 1 over x minus 2 squared. I'll write that as x minus 2 to the negative 2. And in this case, I could do a u substitution and write it out explicitly, but I like to use the mental u substitution in this case because this is a linear factor and my coefficient is 1. That always makes it easy to do these. I think of this as u to the negative 2, which gives me u to the negative 1 divided by negative 1. So what I'll get in this case, again, u being that x minus 2 part. So that's to the negative 1 divided by negative 1. Or in other words, 
what this would be is uh, one negative one over x minus two. So with that information in mind, what I'm going to do then is plug that in for each of these. And also importantly, what I'm gonna add at this point are these limit statements. So this is an, an improper integral from zero to t, as t goes to two from the left. This case right here, it's from five down to two, or from t to five, where t is gonna be approaching two from the right. And before we can do any playing with the limits, we need to show these evaluation terms. Again, when I plug in the zero and five, I'm just gonna get an actual real number out. The fun part is playing with when I plug in these t's. So let's just do it right here. What I'm gonna have here on this left limit, uh, the limit as t goes to two from the left. When I plug in a t here, what I get is negative one over t minus two. And then the second term is what I get when I plug in a zero here. So minus negative one over negative two, which will simply be one half. Then I'm adding this limit statement. So I have the limit as t approaches two from the right. My first term is what I get when I plug in a five right here. So I get negative one over five minus two. So that's negative one third. And then my second term will look a lot like this one over here. I'm just gonna plug a t in. So this is minus negative one over t minus two. All right then, and now I'm going to evaluate these limits. Again, these constant terms don't do anything interesting. What I need to do is analyze these terms right here. And this is really important. Back to the original statement when I was defining these, this only has a value and only converges if both of these converge. If one is divergent, we're stopped, we throw up our hands and say, we can't find a value, it's divergent. And actually that it happens here in this first term, it actually happens over here too, but I'm not even gonna get there. In this case, as t approaches two, this denominator goes to zero, so we get negative one, over a denominator that goes to zero, which means this term goes to infinity, and thus this entire integral is divergent. And again, that's really important. When, if any of our terms, when we're doing these, any of our terms in calculating these integrals, if they go to infinity or if they're unbounded, it means we don't have a convergent integral, we cannot find a value. I gotta say, in this section, we're not gonna have any new integration stuff. In fact, most of the integration will be pretty straightforward for us. The, the main thing is now applying these limit statements and reviewing the limit things that we were dealing with before, the limit laws, the limit rules that we can apply. In this case, we're often not gonna apply L'Hopital's, though we could, because these are simply limit statements at this sense. And also, we're not gonna be dealing usually with horizontal asymptotes, but we also, we might be, and very often, because because the nature of these, in these limit statements, be dealing with these, these awkward limits that happen at vertical asymptotes or these non-continuous points. And again, the argument here is, if my numerator stays constant and my denominator goes to zero as this t value gets close to two, that means the value of this ratio right here will go to infinity.